The year was 2010. Development for Fire Emblem New Mystery the Emblem was finished, and the next game of the series would begin conceptualization. However, the early period for the development would prove to be dicey. The beginning phases moved very slow, and simply planning the game took a long time. To make matters worse, the team was given an ultimatum by Nintendo. Series sales had been on the decline worldwide, with near consistently each game selling less than the one before it, a pattern proving mostly true since Fire Emblem 7 in 2003. The team was basically told to sell or shelve, and that this next game could very well be their last. Radical ideas ran rampant through the studio, like setting the game in a modern time, or even have the game take place on Mars. These were real ideas. Though I would argue that these additions were less about trying to find a broader or ambitious appeal, but more about trying something new that they would not have the chance to attempt ever again. However, the eventual conclusion was if that this would be their last game in the series, then they should make one that celebrates Fire Emblem in its entirety by bringing back favorite mechanics from many games and be able to implement some new ideas that were not attempted before. On April 19th, 2012, Fire Emblem Awakening was released to the Japanese public. No matter what the fate of the series would be, Intelligent Systems could be proud that they could send off their beloved Fire Emblem without any regrets. We return to the land that's been a part of Fire Emblem since the beginning, the very same continent that the Hero King Marth ruled. 1,000 years before the events of Awakening, a great and evil dragon named Grima was evil and wanted to kill people for evil. But a champion from the Halidom of Elise rose to challenge the dragon. With the blessings of the divine dragon Naga, this champion carried the dragon slayer Falchion and the Fire Emblem into battle. Through his efforts, he defeated the fell dragon and peace was brought back to the world. Naga then blessed the hero with a brand that would be carried by his family throughout the generations. This man would be named in Legends as the first Exalt, and ruler of Elise. Coming to the current day, our story focuses on two characters. The first one of these characters is Krom, descendant of the first Exalt, current Prince of Elise, and captain of his own military division, the Shepherds. Our second main character is you. Returning from Mystery the Emblem in Fire Emblem 7, you have a customizable avatar unit that acts as Krom's tactician. The avatar is able to speak, unlike Sevens, but unlike New Mystery the Emblem, you can't determine their backstory and upbringing like you could with Chris. For this reason, we're going to keep the default settings and just refer to this character as Robin. If we want to talk about Awakening story, it's important to look at how it's structured. Mystery of the Emblem and Genealogy of the Holy War separated their story into two books. Radiant Dawn was split up into four parts, with the events of one leading into the next. If we were to apply that same logic to Awakening, what we have is a three-part narrative. In the first book, demonic creatures called Risen are starting to appear around the world. With their appearance is also a new character going by the name of Marth, warning them that their future will be chaotic and that Krom and company should be careful. Tensions with Elisa's neighboring country of Pelagia are at a high point, and now with zombies appearing, a lot of fear is now hanging in the air. Krom deploys the Shepherds to Regna Ferox in hopes of recruiting some allies in case Elise can't deal with everything all at once. Throughout their journey, the Shepherds keep encountering Marth, unsure if he, or more accurately she, is a rival or friend. It turns out that war eventually begins on the continent. The capital city of Alistal eventually falls, and Exalt Emerin is captured by Pelagia, with Krom and Robin needing to lead the charge personally to rescue Emerin and end the war. During the second book of the game, the neighboring continent of Valm is under conquest by Emperor Rudolf. Wait, I'm sorry, uh, Emperor Walhart, with the purpose being to unite men to be strong and stand free from gods. Hold on, is this right? The nations of the East, despite their differing ideals, don't want to be conquered, and so Elise, Regna Ferox, and Pelagia must all come together to end Walhart's reign. It is also around this time that Marth reveals herself yet again, mistakenly calling Krom father. When being questioned about this, she reveals that her real name is Lucina, daughter of Krom, and that she is from a future where the world was destroyed by Grima. Meeting Tiki not long later explains how Krom can prevent this as well. 
with context established for why the Dark God must never return, and clearly establishing that this is a Fire Emblem game, Krom promises his daughter that he will do whatever it takes to stop the current wars, Grima, and her future from ever coming true. This eventually leads into the third part of the game, where the Shepherds do whatever they can to track down the remaining gemstone of the Fire Emblem, in order to perform the Awakening Rite and strike down the Fell Dragon, should he ever return. Fire Emblem enthusiasts may notice quite a few positive changes right off the bat. Regardless of how you feel about the contents of the story overall, it's pretty easy to say that this is the most well-presented narrative in the series. Fire Emblem moved away from the novelization story tropes that had been present since the beginning. There were significantly less exposition dumps. Character portraits and text boxes presented the cutscenes like always, but this time they were accompanied by character models, acting out the scenes. It makes the story feel much more exciting, if only by a small degree. And of course, pre-rendered cutscenes are used for key events. To me, these are still the best looking and acted in the series still. There is also some voice acting to accompany these scenes, but now there is spoken dialogue throughout the entire game. It's sadly not full voice acting though. Whenever characters speak, it's always accompanied by short quips or grunts. I don't mind the voice clips during battle, but in certain story scenes, there are some disparities between the intended motion of the scene and the voice clip used. It's fine that the game doesn't want to have full voice acting, but these half-step quips always felt a little out of place, even if they don't bother me all that much. That's pretty much where the positives end though. Fans of the series often criticize Awakening for having the weakest story in the series by this point. The overall plot is very disconnected, taking place within three separate story arcs. And while the events of the next part can't happen without the events of the previous ones, they're only connected by loose plot threads which are pretty easily missable if your attention drifts during the wrong conversations. And while the chapter opening text crawls were gone, this could be seen as a negative in itself. Without that exposition, the places you traveled to just became locations. You didn't get a feel for your surroundings, there was no tension in the air. There were fewer NPCs to clue you in on the politics of the situation. The gameplay story integrations that Fire Emblem had excellently woven in the past were severely lacking in Awakening. The story ends up taking missteps that seem to forego logical explanations and motives. I appreciate that Intelligent Systems wanted to make a callback story with a ton of etymological references to Shadow Dragon, Gaiden, and Genealogy of the Holy War, but the second act of this game feels like a shoehorned idea that doesn't neatly fit with the rest of the narrative. It almost feels like Intelligent Systems had a particular set of story events and progression in mind, but because telling that story was so important to them, they couldn't bring themselves to cut or even rework ideas and characters that didn't work. To demonstrate just how little the writers thought about the setting of this game, allow me to give you a little quiz. What is the name of the main continent that Fire Emblem Awakening takes place on? Is it A. Arcanea, B. Valm, or C. Elise? You may now submit your answers. Okay, seeing some pretty good guesses across the board. Nice. All right. Time's up. Now the correct answer to the question is D. We still don't know. The names of whatever continent we were journeying across was almost always the first thing we were told about every game in the series up to this point. I scoured both this game and official sources to find any definitive name for this place, and I couldn't. This is the most baffling oversight I can imagine. I mean, how hard is it to come up with a name for a place? Heck, I'll do it right now. The continent's name is Amarth. See what I did there? I took the first letter of what the continent used to be called, and just put it next to debatably the most influential person in that continent's history. See how clever I am? A shame that Intelligent Systems didn't have anyone as smart as me. But there's also one other aspect of the story I want to talk about. A play is only as effective as the performance of its actors. The cast of Awakening isn't really that special. The majority of characters in this game are unidimensional. They have one primary trait that basically defines their personality, and such is the thing that many of the support conversations revolve around. Now this by itself isn't inherently a bad thing. I actually think that one-dimensional characters are a benefit in a cast as large as Fire Emblems. While they aren't as well-written characters as a majority of other casts, I will say that Awakening still probably has the most memorable characters in the series anyway. Awakening is also the funniest game in the series. Often a clever joke will be thrown into conversation, but the humorous antics of the Shepherds also really sell the angle that they're a tight-knit group of friends that value their bonds with each other. 
By the time I finished my first playthrough, I didn't forget about any one of these characters. Something that no other game in the series has been able to do for me before or since. At least drawing from my own personal experience, the problem isn't being unidimensional. It's that the wrong characters are. While I don't mind simple characters for the background units that don't get much screen time, the more involved supporting casts leaves a lot to be desired. When the most character growth that Frederick goes through in this game is beginning to trust Robin more by the time the game is over, then it's time to go back to the drawing board. It's not even similar to Steiner, where his loyalties become questionable, and that's what inspires his change in attitude towards Zidane. Frederick just doesn't like Robin. And all of a sudden one day, he likes him. It would be one thing if it was just Frederick and Lyssa. Even the villains are so flat that they leave so little impact. Awakening has the worst villains in the series, falling into the similar trappings as previous titles. A simple thing that the writers could have done to make their antagonists more despicable is to have them run away in the middle of a battle. Like, what if the reason you got on ships for Volm is because that's where Gangrel escaped to when he realized he was cornered? What if he actually became a part of Walhart's war council? What if Valadar or Adversa advised Gangrel to do this? And that's not even the worst example of boring characters. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to Krom. I don't think it's wrong to say that Krom is one of the more popular lords in the fanbase. And I don't think that's remotely deserved. The things I feel about Krom that are interesting character traits are details I had to extrapolate from what we are told about him. I can't say that he doesn't change from beginning to end, but just like Frederick, it's light switch growth. He starts off as a carefree noble that has no interest in politics and diplomacy. And one day he just decides to grow up and take those things into account. After the first act of the story, he loses almost any agency he had, so his changing perspectives can't be challenged by his enemies. I honestly forgot he was the main character of the story. Not like Robin's much better. A kind of endearing goofball with a gift for tactics, but that never really evolves. At least what the story lacks in intrigue, it makes up in brevity. It seldom takes more time than it needs, so it can be appreciated for just a fun fantasy romp. Because aside from its many missteps, the core theme of Fire Emblem Awakening is well implemented. That together, people are more than the sum of their parts. And together, people can forge their own destiny. But destiny doesn't have to be what is already known. They can be changed. Awakening is the game in the series that is the most obvious about its themes. But that doesn't make the lessons any less valid. Despite every problem that can be found in this game's story, there's a lot that can be taken away from it. But what kind of additions can we expect from Awakening to push the strategy RPG forward? Well, the thing about that is Awakening was more focused on bringing old systems back, and it did so incredibly well. Any possible problem or issue that could have been in the previous games was near perfected in Awakening. I'm probably going to get tired after talking about what's here, so in honor of a segment that reintroduces mechanics, allow me to reintroduce a guest that's been away from the channel for some time. Take it away, Deep Voice Chris. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Deep Voice Chris, and I'm here to talk to you about all the returning features from Fire Emblem Past in Fire Emblem Awakening. So let's get cracking! The world map makes its return to the series, once again to serve as a way to gain experience and purchase items from previously visited areas. Traversal across it was very easy, and you could move past optional battles if you didn't want to partake in them. And if you helped villagers in contact with the Risen, you could get various rewards for doing so. Along the way, side quests will open up, and completing them will not only grant whatever benefits come with finishing that chapter, but also open shops with really good items and weapons that can be obtained earlier than they would normally appear in a main story chapter shop. The world map also means a great opportunity to reintroduce branching classes again, a feature not present since the Sacred Stones. Most class changes are typically a good option, so relax and choose what you want. But if you didn't like the class you chose, you could use a second seal to reclass the units into a brand new class. On the intended scale, meant to reallocate a troop into something more favorable. If all of your favorite mages died, you might be able to change one of your existing units into one. On the reality scale, it actually means an infinite level cap with nearly every soldier being able to learn the most broken skill set possible. Granted, that you're willing to put the time into doing so. Speaking of, skills also make a return after a brief departure with the remakes. 
Beforehand, there were different skill cards that, when obtained, could be equipped on any unit to enhance their battle performance. As a unit levels up, they will gain different skills based on their class. In addition, the capacity requirement was removed, and in its place, any unit could equip any five skills they learned at any given time. A much easier system to implement and understand. Also pulled from Binding Blade and Genealogy, Awakening reintroduces the support system, but in a completely different light than before. Like before, getting higher support ranks will increase certain bonuses for those two units. And also like before, there are different rankings based on letters, C, B, and A, but also with the introduction of the S rank. S was only available between a pair of male and female units. In other words, this is our marriage system. With Awakening, any unit can support any other compatible unit all the way up to the A ranking. That being said, a pair of units can only have one S support ranking on one single playthrough. The support marriage system wasn't as flexible as Genealogy of the Holy War, since not everyone could marry each other, or even support every other unit in the game. But with how much opportunity you had to view support conversations, this is easily our favorite implementation in the series, and playing Matchmaker was extremely fun and provided a lot of replay value. Marriage had other benefits as well though. Married couples would have a child together that, due to time travel shenanigans, would allow for parents and children to fight alongside each other. Just like in genealogy, the mother would be the determining parent for each child. However, the father had influence over the hair color and passed on his equipped skills to the next generation. A set of parents would only have one child together. The only two exceptions to this were Krom and Robin, as they are the only two male characters in this game who are also a determining parent. And thus concludes what was returning for the Fire Emblem series. Thanks again, Deep Voice Chris. I must say, I think the tone of your voice has improved since last time. Why, thank you, regular Chris. In fact, I would say that your voice has improved as well, if only marginally. Hey. Thanks. I don't have much more to add about the mechanics that can't be said about just describing what's in this game. The refinements of these old systems were really solid, and easily the best thing about playing Awakening. But it's what the game tries to do on its own that leads it astray. Much earlier in this retrospective, I said I wanted to be fair and talk about the points where Fire Emblem stepped forward as well as backward. And I must admit that Awakening does step backward in many ways. The first big one being the map design. One might say the weakest maps in the series. These are not such baseless claims though. Almost every map in Awakening is small and features a lot of open space. Not quite like Gaiden, but something similar. Because of this, every gameplay section in Awakening is very short. Chapter 3, 6, 14, and 17 are all pretty solid maps, but that being said, there are more stinkers than winners. Look at Chapter 7, it's functionally just a hallway. That's right, a hallway. What wondrous and beauteous level design we are graciously given for the 13th installment of this long-running RPG series that players have been experiencing since the Famicom. Yet I feel it doesn't hinder the experience that Awakening provides. These condensed map layouts were intentional decisions that made it less tedious to grind if you did so choose. Backtracking through maps you already completed for more experience wasn't a tedious process. Whether you think it was a great consideration is up for you to decide. As for me, I think this concession sacrificed engaging map layouts. But none of the maps in this game are obnoxious, so there aren't any parts of this game that I dread playing again. But where the maps suffer greatly and miss their potential is in variety. Awakening has a really absurd problem for a game so late in the series. Every map's objective is either rout the enemy or defeat the commander. Awakening has an equal amount of objective variety as Fire Emblem Gaiden. You know, a game that was 20 years old at this point? And this is really baffling. There are some maps and scenarios where it's perfectly suited to defend a person or seize a throne, or even escape the map. Even if it does nothing to change the maps, it will at least introduce mission variety and change the mindset of the players from chapter to chapter. Hey, the map design isn't all that bad. Awakening has some redeeming qualities to it. This is the first game in the series since Genealogy of the Holy War to not have a Fog of War mission! Whoo! The next big criticism comes with Awakening's staple addition to the gameplay, pair-up. 
In pair up, the ally goes into battle with the lead member, and will assist with double strikes and defensive blocks, should RNG allow for it. Pair up is a useful feature, but that's also where the problem lies. Pair up is too useful. Not only does it completely protect weaker units, it also buffs the paired units and condenses the space you need to take up on the board. And as paired units stick together, their support rank will increase, which given that they're compatible units, will further buff the pair in battle. You don't even have to combine units together to take full advantage of the system. Putting units adjacent to each other won't buff your teammates, but they'll still attack and defend them. There is no reason not to pair everyone off. On top of that, pair up is a feature that only your party has access to. There is not one set of enemy units in Awakening that are combined with each other. So by sheer existence of the way it's implemented, pair up breaks Awakening's balance in your favor. But the thing about Awakening is that the culmination of its gameplay could have been something truly amazing. The best chapter in the game is ironically one that not everyone is going to see. Paralogue 17, where you recruit Tiki, is so wonderful. Your objective, protect her while she restores her powers. Your opposition, a horde of Wyvern and Griffin Riders. But the enemy won't aggro player controlled units on enemy phase, so it's completely up to the player to clean up as much as possible on their turn. It's the one map in Awakening where pairing everyone up right at the start is actually a terrible strategy, as you need as many people as possible for both building a defensive line and clearing out the waves of enemies. Positioning characters just right so they can still take advantage of their support bonuses is rewarding to properly set up. This chapter proves that Awakening had truly good ideas, but it's every other chapter in the game that shows Team Emblem didn't know how to utilize them in any other instance. This is the main takeaway I had from my time playing this game again. Fire Emblem Awakening is a flawed game that isn't able to accomplish what its predecessors set out to do. I know that a lot of people with a more casual perspective on the series really love this game, and that's understandable. This is still a really well put together game. It's not buggy or unpolished, it looks nice, it plays well, it's still a great game. But this game wasn't successful because it was the only game in the series worthy of salvaging the Fire Emblem name. Honestly, more than anything, Awakening just got lucky. It was released at the right time on a system whose owners were hungering for any new release they could get. If anything, the reason this game is held in such high regard for the series is because it just managed to hit the right notes for many people. Including some certain video creators in particular. It's time for me to confess something. Awakening is my favorite game in the series. And that's the problem with having to objectively review this game. Because when I compare it to the others in the series, Awakening admittedly doesn't hold up. But no matter how much criticism is levied towards this game, no matter how much my opinions of it have changed over the years, nothing can alter this one simple fact. This is the game in the Fire Emblem series I enjoy playing the most. Because it's just the most fun! I love how much Awakening improved on so many basic features. I love grinding on the world map and being able to play this game at my own pace. I love how putting time into certain builds can trivialize this game. I love the characters of this game. I love that Awakening broke the five conversations rule. I love coming back and self-imposing myself different challenges. And as I played this game again, a wave of nostalgia came over me. I felt like I was 17 playing this game for the first time. I love Fire Emblem Awakening. It's the game that made me the Fire Emblem fan I am today. And for that reason alone, this is one of my favorite video games of all time. And had this been the finale of Fire Emblem, I would finish this game without any regrets. But that's not where the story ended. When it came time to be released in Japan, it hit its mark. The game sold its nearly 250,000 goal within the first week alone. And when the game eventually came overseas, the success was staggering. It's kind of fitting that a game about changing one's fate also ended up being the game that would change the fate of the series itself. Meaning that it was time to start developing a sequel. And if there's a game in the series that's even more polarizing than Awakening, it's sure to be the next one we're talking about. So join me next time as we see where the waves of fate shall carry us on our journey.